Hello and welcome once again to this Red Gamer Tech video. Myself, Amato, as always, I'm here with the latest news from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours. We've got a bit more of a mixed bag today after yesterday's very Intel focused video, but we are going to start off with an Intel piece of news in the form of Horse Ridge. And yes, you just heard me correctly, this is Horse Horse Ridge, and is for quantum computing systems. It is a cryogenic control chip that will speed up development of full stack quantum computing systems. And according to Intel themselves, this particular chip is going to enable commercially viable quantum computers. So, according to the information they've released, this chip can control multiple quantum bits or qubits at the same time, which is essential to building a large-scale commercial quantum system, at least according to the information released by the company. And essentially what Intel are trying to do with this chip is simplify the design of quantum computers, which will again enable them to hit more significant performance levels and really hit them at that commercial level. That's because at present they just take up a lot of space and obviously they can only operate at certain temperatures and that is the case of Horse Ridge as well. This particular SOC can operate at cryogenic temperatures which is approximately 4 degrees Kelvin and if, for those of you who are curious it's ever so slightly warmer than absolute zero. So time will tell of course how relevant this particular SOC ends up being for the world of quantum computing but still rather interesting. But speaking of Intel, we actually had a very interesting comment at the International Electronic Devices meeting regarding Lakefield and a refresh. Now I just want to thank Anantech.com for not only the previous article but this one as well. You can find both of them linked in the description below this video. But at the IEDM event they had two presentations. One was talking about Omnidirectional Interconnect and one about Foveros, which of course is their new 3D stacking technology which we discussed right when it was announced what feels like eons ago. But it was during the Foveros event that a very interesting comment was made by an Intel principal engineer. And they basically said that by holiday 2020, we can expect to see a refresh of Lakefield in the market. Unfortunately, he did not deign to give us any more information than that, just that a refresh is going to exist and it's going to exist by the end of 2020. It's really too difficult to speculate on what it could actually be. Perhaps it's just going to be a slightly tweaked, improved version of Foveros, or it's going to be something entirely separate from Foveros itself, but obviously still relevant to Lakefield. It could be a new IO die for the next generation of PCIe, or, or something along those lines. It, it, possibilities, it could literally be anything, because that's all they said. A refresh is going to exist. But let's move on from Intel now to TSMC. So this is also fresh from the IEEE IEDM conference where TSMC presented a paper given the initial results they have achieved on their 5NM process. And they brought with them some very bold claims as to the improvements that they're seeing so far with the improvements as well as the yields on the process as well. So they're saying that the 5NM EUV process gives an overall 1.84 times logic density increase 15% power gain or a 30% power reduction. Now do keep in mind this is on the current test chip, so that is very important to keep in mind. And apparently this test chip is yielding 80% on average and 90% in peak. But unfortunately when you scale that back to say a mobile size chip, the yield does go down significantly. But it is currently in risk production, high volume production will not begin until the first half of 2020. So essentially, as they've already said previously, we will be seeing 5NM chips, or chips built on in 5NM I suppose you should say, by the last half of 2020. And let me refresh your memory that they're already on track for 3NM as well. So TSMC just continued to be on an absolute tear. And it's just going to be very interesting to see what the next few years look like, especially because of the news that I discussed yesterday, where Intel confirmed that they are going to be returning to a TikTok two-year cadence, which basically means when we're going to be seeing, you know, 10NM++ and 10NM++++, like we have seen with 14NM. So basically, you can see more in my video yesterday, you can find it linked below, or it literally was uploaded yesterday, but... 
the TLDR is essentially once we see a ten and M's issues ironed out and it actually starts really going out there with lots of products for consumers and yada yada yada. It's going to be sticking around for a long time. Whereas of course with AMD, with the next iteration, we're going to be seeing on seven NM plus, and then of course they're going to be moving on to five NM after that. So. Basically, Intel could still be on 10NM while AMD is moving on 7NM plus and then 5NM and then, of course, 3NM beyond, the, beyond that, excuse me. Of course, a lot of this is speculation, but still very, very interesting stuff. But speaking of AMD, we actually have an update next for the RX 5500 XT as it has been officially launched. Or should I see, uh, should I say rather, that AIB variants of the 5500 XT graphics cards have launched today, which once again is of course the Navi 14 GPU. And just to refresh your memory on the specifications, it does feature 1408 stream processors, which means there are 22 compute units on the card, 88 TMUs and 32 ROPs, with a clock speed of 1670 MHz base and 1717 MHz game and 1845 MHz boost. And this all basically calculates up to 5.19 teflops of compute performance and naturally does come in 8GB and 4GB variants. As for the price tag of this, the 8GB variant is launching at $199 US. And once again, this is competing against NVIDIA's 1660 Super. But the 4GB model is launching at $169 US, which is competing against, price-wise, the 1650 Super. So with that in mind, let's move back to Intel momentarily, as they have taken on some new talent in the form of the former Global Foundries and IBM executive. And this is a fellow by the name of Gary Patton, who once again was Chief Technology Officer at Global Foundries, and this is according to an internal Intel memo, which was seen by Reuters just yesterday. And he also previously spent more than a decade at IBM. So safe to say, Gary is rather experienced. Now, Intel, of course, went for a bit of a period of poaching a lot of talent from a lot of companies, a lot of which came from AMD, such as, you know, including people such as Raja Kodori and obviously Jim Keller. So safe to say that he's going to be in pretty good company. So what is he actually going to be doing at Intel, here you ask? Well, basically, he's just going to be the Corporate Vice President and General Manager of Design Enablement, and is going to be reporting directly to the CTO of the company. So, with all that in mind, let's move on to our final topic, which is something that I just want to talk about because I like the game, okay? Regarding Resident Evil 3. Sorry, not Resident Evil 3, I meant Resident Evil 2. I got a bit mixed up because, of course, we just had the official reveal at Sony's State of Play for the Resident Evil 3 remake, which I'm very hoped for. I'm a little bit concerned that it's going to be rushed because it's only coming out in um, in April, I think. It, the American date always confuses me, but yeah, it's, it's April, I'm pretty sure. Anyway, so yeah, I'm a bit concerned that it's going to be rushed, but we'll see, we'll see. I'm not here to talk about Resident Evil 3, actually. I'm here to talk about Resident Evil 2 because, of course, Capcom... Basically said, way back in the day, that if Resident Evil 2 did well enough, they would consider a Resident Evil 3 remake, and well, here we are. And they have actually given a bit of a press release, which will be linked in the description below this video, in which they revealed that the game has done very, very well for itself, has achieved more than 5 million units in sales. And that makes it more popular than its actual original game, the one on the PS1, which I just love Resident Evil 2, <laughs> played that too, too much. Um, but they did say that it shifted 3 million copies during its launch week, obviously slowed down a bit after them. Um, it hit 4 million sales in March, and now, of course, has reached past 5 million, just in time for the announcement regarding Resident Evil 3. And I'm just, I'm just happy to share this news, to be honest, because it's a great game. It's a really great game. I was genuinely a bit nervous, because, yes, Resident Evil 7 was great. But before that, Capcom... We're just going a bit very, very downhill with Resident Evil. Like Resident Evil 4 was good, Resident Evil 5 was okay, and 6 was just blech. And then all the side games that just were terrible. So I was nervous, but it obviously turned out to be amazing. Clearly a lot of love poured into it. 3 is definitely going to be an interesting one to watch. As I said, a bit concerned it's a bit rushed, but obviously we don't know how long it's actually been in development. So we'll have to wait and see, of course. Not that long, only a few months until it comes out, and I'm definitely going to be playing it at, uh, pretty much day one. Hopefully it will be streaming it, assuming I can actually get a decent schedule on the channel, because our Twitch channel has just sat there, not doing anything. 
I'm hoping to change that soon. Anyway, that's me done for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.